discussing in this meeting, we're going to first complete our discussion of the special census. If you remember last class, we have discussed the vision and the anatomical structure of the eye. Another thing that we started our discussion off was hearing and the anatomy of the ear. Today we are discussing two other sensations that will be detected by the by the ear as well. Those are going to be two different sensations of the balance. All right, so after we complete our discussion of the special senses, we're going to then discuss more about the autonomic nervous system. which is going to be chapter thirteen. And after break, we're going to be discussing the endocrine system, which would be chapter sixteen. So once we complete those chapters, this going to be everything that you're going to need to know for the last lecture exam. If you remember, our last lecture exam, lecture exam four, is going to be covering chapters 13, 15, and 16. If we got time at the end, we're going to be going over the most important diagrams that you should be preparing for for the last lab exam lab exam four which covers the nervous system and special senses so again again today we're having not 14, not 14, 15, 16, it's 13, 15, and 16, I believe. Or will it be autonomic, autonomic? Let me double check. You might be right, I don't remember. Yeah, so it's gonna be 14, I'm sorry. 14, 14, 15, and 16, yes, 14, 15, and 16. So both exams are going to be available for you by the end of the day today. So expect it to be available for you to complete by midnight to today. So it's going to be available for one week. It's going to close next Tuesday. It's going to be available for you to complete for seven days. For those who are asking about the final review, final review, this will not be considered anymore. For the final review, which is worth 40 points towards your grade, it won't be considered. So your final grade for this course is gonna be out of 960 versus than 1000. And your grade is gonna be a percent out of 960. All right, so I will not be collecting the final review handout. Some of you were asking about the final review handout. I will not be collecting final review handout. We won't have enough time to get this completed. Any general questions concerning the lab exam for? Where to study for the lab exam for 
on Canvas, you will have a lab exam for final review that has the most important diagrams that you're gonna be tested on. This includes the central nervous system and the special senses. At the end today, at the end of our meeting today, in the last 30 minutes, I will go over the main diagrams, which we have recently covered, which includes the brain, includes the eye and includes and includes the ear, special senses and the central nervous system. This is lecture exam four. This is our last lecture exam. You still have lecture exam three open. So if you didn't complete it, get it completed but we have already covered those chapters tested in, uh, in lecture exam three. All right, so what did we mention so far in terms of anatomical structure? And so Nico here, just to make sure I understand, is the review, the big document of homework that we did. No, the, this is a difference. This is the in class. So what you did, what you did complete throughout the different meetings, either in class or virtually, those are called the in class activities. And those are going to be curved. So, for example, you did complete eight activities, somebody else did complete 12, somebody else did complete seven. You add all the activities that you have completed into one PDF file that you're going to be uploading to Canvas. And I will look at the average, how, how many assignments were completed by the class and your grade is going to be determined according to the average if you are completing much more than the average this means you're going to be adding extra credit points yes you need to include the ones that you've come we've completed in class before we stop having our face-to-face -face meetings, yes. You can simply scan them or get pictures of them and add them to this file that you're gonna be submitting. Last class I said seven as an example as an example of the average. So I need to collect all the assignment from everybody to determine what's going to be the average and your grade will be weighted according to the average of your class. Is this clear, Era? The extra credits, the five extra credit those were, those is the extra credits that will be when you complete the in-class activities. If you are, if you did complete more extra credit, uh, more in-class activities than the average of, the, of your class, this is gonna be considered your extra credit points. The five extra credit points that I mentioned also last time, those for the completion of the instructional evaluation. And you can access this from my FSCJ. Don't wait until the last minute to get this completed because it usually closes like a week before class ends or something like this. 
or a few days before the class ends. So get this completed. And once you complete, it tells you, for example, you rate four, five, three, two, one for each of the things that you're gonna be rating for the class. And once you get this completed, it will show you a thank you page at the end. Please get a screenshot of the thank you page that will be appearing after you complete your instructional evaluation and this screenshot you will be adding it with the document that you're going to be uploading the of the in-class activities so one of the things that you might be uploading for five extra credit points towards your grade is going to be the thank you page, a screenshot of the thank you page that will appear after you complete the instructional evaluation. Five extra points, not 5%. So it's not 5% of the grade. All right. It's on my FSCJ. My FSCJ. So when you open your courses, when you open your courses, you will be able to, the courses that you are enrolled to or you are enrolled in, you will see a tab next to the course name. This is where you can have access to the instructional evaluation. So if you did complete the, this earlier, you can just take a screenshot of the course name that doesn't show the tab present. It's not showing that complete the tabs that says complete the evaluation. And if it's not showing this tab, you sim this simply means that you did already complete. So take a screenshot of the course name showing that you don't have this tab anymore. So this means that you have already completed it and this screenshot again will be added to your in plus activities file. All right, you're gonna add the screenshot to your in class activities file. This is how you're gonna be submitting this. Is this clear for everybody? Any further questions? Any further questions? Concerning exams, concerning when they will be available, how the grading is gonna look like. So what you're gonna need to do right now, check that you've completed Lecture exam one, lecture exam two, lecture exam three, and lecture exam four will be available for you to complete this week. So by the end of this week, you need to have completed all of the four lecture exams. If you didn't complete any of them, please email me. If you didn't complete any of the lecture exams, please email me. Also, 
you need to have completed lab exam one, which covers the tissues. Lab exam two, which covers the bones. You should also have completed lab exam three, which covers the muscles. And lab exam four is gonna be available for you to complete this week. So we have completed already three lecture exams, three lab exams, and we still have one lecture exam, one lab exam. Those two are still remaining. So what else should I worry about? If I've already completed three lecture exams, and this is the case for most of, of you. What else should I worry about is in class activities. And the lab assignments, which are conducted through visible body courseware. You need to make sure that you've completed all the four lab assignments. You've got four lab assignments that you should have completed so far. Yeah, lab exam four is gonna be through Canvas, like the bones lab exam, like the muscles lab exam. It's gonna be the same way like what we did for lab exam four. In class activities, again, you're gonna be combining all the activities that you have completed in class and virtually when we moved online. Combine them into a single PDF file that you're gonna be uploading on Canvas where it says in class activities and pop quizzes, upload the single file. You will see a, a tab where you can upload this file single PDF file that's going to be reviewed and again the grade here your grade is going to be determined according to the rest of the class performance so your grade is going to be the maximum point is going to be the average all right so if the class the average, the, the average number for completion of the in-class activities was seven assignments. So for those who did complete the seven assignments, they will get the full grade for the in-class activities. If you've completed more than seven assignments of the in-class activities, those extra assignments that you completed beyond average, those are gonna be considered extra credit points. All right, so our last in-class activity is gonna be conducted today. So from today, you should be able to upload the in-class activities. Starting from today, you can upload your in-class activities. Today is gonna to be the last in-class activities that will be given to you. All right, so again, again, what you should worry about, what you should have completed so far, you should have completed three lecture exams three lab exams, and you should be aware that you need to complete both lecture exam four and lab exam four. You should also make sure that you combine all the in-class activities that you have completed. And your in-class activities will be weighted according to the average of assignments completed by your class. You need also to make sure that you have completed the four lab assignments that you should have completed through Visible Body Courseware. And this is actually a very important thing for you to prepare for the lab exam. You need also to complete the uh, nervous system lab assignments. This will help you studying for lab exam four. All right, for those who want to complete 
the final exam. Please email me your class day and time. And that you want to get to complete the final exam. And I will be sending specific information for you. Final exam replaces the lowest lab exam grade. If you missed the lecture exam, let me know. I know I will open it up for you the final lab the final exam the optional final exam again is optional and is going to be replacing the lowest lab exam please email me first name last name your class day and time. So for example, I'm attending Tuesday, Thursday at nine o'clock. So to, to TR900. I'm attending Wednesday, 10 o'clock. So 10 a.m. So Wednesday, 10 a.m. This is what I need to know. And I will be telling you specific information. I will be creating a messaging group on canvas and i will be addressing those people who want to take the final exam i don't want to give the information to everybody for for me to not create more confusion so only for those who are willing to complete the final exam only for those who need to complete the final exam they will need to contact me directly for the part two of Tuesday, it was not recorded. It was not recorded. But the information that I, I did cover on Tuesday was reviewed at the beginning of the Thursday meeting. All right. Hershey. Hershey. Does this answer your question? All right, so the information that I've covered in the second half of the Tuesday, of the Tuesday class was recorded, but it didn't record, Zoom did not record the sound. So what I did is uploading the first half that has the sound for, and for the second half was not uploaded because it, it won't make any sense. It doesn't have any sound for it. And the materials that I have covered in the second half of, the, of this meeting was reviewed at the beginning of the Thursday class. All right, any questions, any questions? So your main concern so far for the next week, which is our last week, complete lecture exam four, complete lab exam four, which is gonna be available until Tuesday next week. Put together all the in-class activities and if you want to complete the instructional, instructional evaluations, this is gonna be for five extra credit points towards your in class activities great so you're going to be adding the thank you a screenshot of the thank you page to your in class activities files that you're going to be uploading and this will be giving you five extra credit points make sure make sure some of the people forget the lab assignments some of the people forget the lab assignments. Please make sure you have completed your four lab assignments, tissues, bones, muscles, and nervous, tissue, and nervous system. We have four lab assignments that are gonna be completed through visible body courseware. Again, if you want to take the final exam, 
if you want to complete the final exam to substitute a missed lab exam or a layup exam that you have you haven't scored well on you need to email me that you want to complete your final exam you need to include in the email your first name last name your class day and time Tuesday Thursday nine o'clock Wednesday ten o'clock whatever your class day and time all right any other concerns compared concerning the lab exams lecture exams anything All right, so what did we discuss so far in the year? If you remember, we did have three main parts of the year. We have the external year and the outer cartilaginous part covered by skin. This is called the ear penna or the article. The article function was to cap capture and collect the sound waves and direct those sound waves through the external auditory or acoustic meatus. And remember, towards the end of the auditory meatus, we did have the tympanic membrane. And remember, this is your eardrum that's going to be responding, vibrating according to the sound waves it will be getting. Those vibrations are going to be transmitted from your external ear through the eardrum to your middle ear. And if you remember, in order for me to allow the free movement of the eardrum, I need to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. So I'm connecting my middle ear to the pharynx by this tube, which is called my pharyngeal tympanic tube. Inside the pharyngeal tympanic, inside the middle ear, I'm sorry, you've got three tiny bones, three ossicles that will be conducting those sound vibrations through your middle ear. Those are the malleus, incus, and stapes. This vibration is going to be conducted through the oval window to the fluid located within the cochlea. Remember, the cochlea here is the organ responsible for hearing in your internal ear. We have three organs located in the internal ear. The organ responsible for hearing is the cochlea. If I have a cut section of the cochlea, how does it look like from inside? We will see that, we did see that the cochlea is a bony cavity and inside this bony cavity I have a membranous tube. So when we look at this section of the cochlea we will figure out that the cochlea is divided into three main spaces. This space is located outside of the membranous tube. Those two spaces are located outside of the membranous tube. So we call the fluid inside the bony cavity, but outside of the membranous tube. This is called my exolymph. Compared to the fluid located inside this membranous tube on here, this is called my endolymph. 
if I'm looking from a side view, this is how the cochlea is going to look like. This is my bony cavity. And traveling in the middle of it, we've got the membranous tube like this. In order for you to hear a sound, you'll see this is my foramen ovale that we've seen on here. Or the oval window, I'm sorry, the oval window. This is what allows the vibrations to be conducted from the ossicles to the fluid located in here. So now the vibrations are conducted from the bone to the fluid. What do we call the fluid again inside the cavity but outside of the membranous tubes? This is my axilla. In order for me to hear the sound, the sound waves needs to have, need to have a certain amplitude and a certain frequency. If I am exposed to a very high frequency, I won't be able to detect the sound. If I am exposed to a very low frequency, I still won't be able to detect the sound. Why? If you are exposed to a very high frequency of the sound, very, very high, it will be passing from this chamber. This is my scala vestibuli to the scala tympani, passing through the scala media, but even before I get closer to where I keep my hearing receptor. So if this is my hearing receptor on here, the sound waves, if I'm detecting a very high frequency sound, it will pass unnoticed. unnoticed. Why? Because it will be penetrating the scala media, this chamber in the middle here, this is what we call scala media. It will penetrate even before I reach the receptor responsible to detect hearing, which is the organ of corti. What if you have a very slow frequency, very low frequency of a sound, like this. This frequency of the sound will fail to penetrate through the scala media, it will fail to pass through this membranous tube. And if it failed to pass, to travel through the membranous tube, I won't hear the sound. So if I have a very high frequency, or a very low frequency of a sound, I still can't hear those frequencies. The frequencies that can penetrate the scala media, causing the activation of the organ of corti, are gonna be between 20 to 20,000 hertz, or 20 to 20,000 hertz. This is the vibrations I can hear. If I have a much greater frequency of the sound, it won't work. If I have sound which have lower frequency than 20 hertz, I, I won't be able to penetrate through the scala media. Again, why do I need to penetrate through the scala media? Why do I need to travel? from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympani passing through the scala media, because this is where I have the receptor responsible for hearing, the organ of corti. The organ of corti is gonna be formed of hair cells with cilia, and those hair cells did have a gelatinous membrane on top of the cilia, this is what we've called, if you remember, the tectorial membrane. Tectorial membrane, it's the gelatinous, the gelatinous membrane that will be attached to the cilia of the hair cells. 
So if I was capable to allow those vibrations to pass from the scala vestibuli to the scala tympana, traveling through the scala media means I'm causing the vibration of the endolymph of the scala media. And this will cause the movement of the tectorial membrane, causing, if I'm magnifying here, just one hair cell of the organ of corti, this will cause the movement of the cilia of the hair cells, causing the opening of sodium channels and allowing those cells to depolarize. Remember, when I open sodium channels, this will allow sodium in. And once you allow sodium in, you create a state of depolarization. And this depolarization of the cell going to be a signal if you get enough stimulation of the organ of corti cells, you're gonna be able to create an electrical impulse, an action potential that has the ability to travel for long distances, traveling through this nerve. We call the nerve that carries the signals responsible for hearing. It's the cochlear division of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So how can I hear again? The organ of corti located in the scala media of my cochlea will become activated. And once it becomes activated, it will be forming electrical impulses that will be traveling up to your medulla, then to your midbrain, then to the thalamus, and then from the thalamus, it gets distributed to your cerebral cortex for you to be able to detect this sound. For me to be able to hear, I need a sensory area in my cerebral cortex, if you remember. So the function of the pharyngeal tympanic tube, what was the function of this tube that will be connecting your pharynx to the middle ear? Pharyngeal tympanic tube. Why do I have a connection between my middle ear, which is a bone cavity inside my temporal bone, to my pharynx, to allow the air to flow in whenever there is a change in the atmospheric pressure, for me to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. Exactly. So here, what is my function? It's to equalize the pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. Moving on to two other organs that will be located in the internal ear. Those are the vestibule, and the three semicircular canals. So again, again, how many organs do I have in my internal ear? Got three organs. First one was responsible for hearing and this is gonna be my cochlea. Another organ here is going to be my vestibule. And the third organ is going to be the three semicircular canals. The vestibule and the semicircular canals are going to be responsible to detect equilibrium and orientation. The vestibular receptors will be monitoring the static equilibrium. Compared to the semicircular canals, they will be monitoring the dynamic equilibrium. What's the difference between static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium? Static equilibrium is going to be your ability 
to detect the position of your head in space. And this is gonna be allowed by the vestibule. The vestibule has two compartments. It's a bony chamber. It's divided into two smaller parts, the saccule and the utricle. Saccule is gonna be continuous with the cochlear duct and the utricle is going to be continuous with the semicircular canal. Inside the utricle and the saccule, we're going to have the receptor responsible to detect the static equilibrium. This is going to be my macula. So I have two macula, one located in the, in, the, in the utricle and one located in the saccule. If you see on here, this is a utricle, this is a saccule, and inside of each of them, you're going to have this receptor. Again, what do we call the receptor responsible for static equilibrium? It's the macula. So what does it mean to be able to determine the position of my head in space? So if you bend your head forward, when you close your eyes, you don't see anything, you bend your head forward, would you be able to know that your head did bend forward? Or you bend your head to the right? Or you bend your head to the left while you're closing your eyes? Would you be able that your head has changed its position in space? What do you think? Yes. How are you able to? Inside, inside the vestibule, inside the saccule and utricle of your vestibule, you have hair cells. similar to the ones that we've just seen in the organ of corti. But those hair cells are slightly different. They have stereocelia and kinocelium. I have two different types of cilia in those hair cells of the macula. I have kinocelium and stereocelium. So when the kinocelium, those ones on here that have the ability to move, will be bending towards the kinocelium, the stereocelium, I'm sorry, on here. Stereocelia are bending towards the kinocelium this will open sodium channels. So what's going to be the state of this cell? It's going to be, if you open sodium channels, what's going to happen to this cell? Yeah, how activated? So we have two electrical states, remember? When you open sodium channels, what's my electrical state? Inside will become more positively charged, outside will become more negatively charged. What do we call this state? Depolarized. If this, the stereocelia are moving away from the kinocelium here. This will cause the opening of potassium channels. And remember, when you open potassium channels, what's going to happen to the cell membrane? Potassium is going to be leaving the cells, making the inside to be even more negatively charged than the resting membrane potential. 
we call this is a hyperpolarization. So how do you know what is the position of the head in space, of your head in space? You have thousands and thousands of those hair cells and you're gonna have stereocelia and chylocelium in all directions. So try to imagine you have only two hair cells, one in your right ear and one in your left. And each of them has only one stereocelia and one chylocelia like this. This is not the situation. It's much more complicated in real life. This is just a simplified way to look at, just for you to imagine how your brain is able to figure out the position of your head in space. So if you are bending your head to the right, this is my head on here and I am bending my head to the right. So what's going to happen is this stereocelium is going to be moving away or towards the kinocelium. Towards or away from the kinocelium. Way. How about on the other side in my left ear? The stereocelia is going to be moving away or towards the kinocelium? Towards the kinocelium. Remember, if I am moving away from the kinocelium, this is going to be opening potassium channels. So potassium is going to be moving out. So what is going to be the state of this cell? It's going to be hyperpolarized. How about in this cell? If I'm moving towards the kinocelium, what's going to happen? I will open sodium channels. So sodium is going to be moving in. And when I move in, what's going to happen to this cell? It's going to be more positive on the inside compared to the outside. This means I am depolarized. So I'm sending a depolarization signal from my left ear. And my right ear is going to be hyperpolarized. My brain will get those two signals and will be figuring out according to the state of hyperpolarization on the right side and the state of depolarization of the left on the left side this means that my head is bent towards the right side this is a very simplified way to look at how your brain can figure out the position of your head in space it's much more complicated than this because you're going to have stereocelia and kinocelium all around and your brain is getting codes of zeros and ones. Zero means I am hyperpolarized, ones means I am depolarized. And he will be decoding all those signals coming from, again, what did we call the name of the receptor responsible for static equilibrium? my macula. And what was the organ where this ma those two maculae that we have are gonna be located? What organ is it? Remember we did have three organs in the internal ear. Cochlea, which is responsible for hearing. What was the other 
organ responsible to detect static equilibrium having mercury inside. This is my vestibule, exactly. Vestibule. So the organ is the vestibule. And this is something, as this is one of the most common wrong answers I usually see. I ask you uh, an or about an organ and your answer is gonna be a receptor. I ask about the receptor and your answer is gonna be an organ and so on. So the organ is the vestibule. The receptor inside the organ responsible to detect static equilibrium is the macro. And how many of them do we have? We've got two. One is the utricle, one is the sacral. If we're looking closer to the structure of the macula, you will see here, hair cells, stereocilia, kinocidium. Um, but those cilia coming out from the hair cells, they are embedded in an autolytic membrane. A membrane that is gonna be formed of calcium stones. Why? You don't want to have any external effect on those cilia. You don't want to have any vibrations causing the movement of those cilia. Try to imagine that any vibrations that you didn't have this autolytic membrane, you don't have this calcium stone membrane covering those cilia. What's going to happen? Any, any kind of vibrations that you get exposed to, you won't be able to figure out the actual position of your head in the space. Can you imagine? So in order to pre prevent something like this from taking place, what will I do? I will be embedding those cilia inside a calcified membrane. Does this make sense? Questions, questions. All right. Moving on to our third and last organ of the internal ear. This is gonna be the semicircular canals. We have three semicircular canals, anterior, lateral, and posterior. Those are the same like the cochlea, they are cavities inside the, the bone and inside which you're gonna have the membranous duct. So you have a cavity, membrane, bony cavity, and inside those bony cavity, you're gonna have the semicircular duct. At the base of each of those ducts, we're going to have a bulging part. We call this as the ampulla. If this is a semicircular canal like this, towards the lower end, you're going to have this bulging region. We call this as the ampulla. And this is the site where you're going to have the receptor responsible to detect the dynamic equilibrium. So again, again, what was static equilibrium? This was your ability to determine the position of your head in space. Dynamic equilibrium is about the angular or rotational movements. So let's have a look at the inside of the semicircular canals. At the base of each of them, you see on here this bulging part. This is called the ampulla. And this is where I have the receptor. And the receptor responsible to detect the dynamic equilibrium is what we call the crista ampullaris. Crista ampullaris. This is the receptor responsible to detect the dynamic equilibrium. 
are you able to detect the movement? What do you think? Would you know that you're moving forward, backward? What do you think? Yes? Are you able to detect motion, movement? So if you're moving forward, backwards, are you able to detect those movements? Are you moving right now along with all your house? If you're sitting still, are you actually moving right now? If you are sitting still, you're not moving any body part of yours. Is your body is moving? Yes, definitely. With the buildings, with the street, with everything, is going to be moving. Why? Because exactly in the Jeep, you are going to be part of the earth, which rotates around its own axis and rotates as well around the sun, right? So are you currently moving? Are you currently rotating? Yes, you are moving. Are you able to detect this movement? No. Because you don't have the ability to detect movement. What do you have is your ability to detect the change in speed. So if you are in your car, you're driving. Do you feel that you are all the time pulled forward? All the time, all the trip? When would you feel that you're moving, especially on a train? When you are accelerating, you are increasing the speed or you are decelerating when you're reducing the speed. So what I feel is not the movement. I feel the change in the speed of the movement. Is this clear? Is this concept clear? This is what we call, again, the dynamic equilibrium. My ability to know whether I'm speeding up or slowing down. Why do you think you're going to have three semicircular canals? Why I don't just have one or, or two or ten or unlimited number of semicircular canals? Why would I have three semicircular canals on here? Yes, there is three dimensions that you can move in. So you can move forward, can move backward, can move up, down. I can move from side to side. Those are the three dimensions that you can move along. So you need three semicircular canals to cover those three dimensions that you can move within. All right, so how do I detect that there is a change in the movement? So try to imagine you have a piece of paper like this, and you have a marker, cylindrical pencil or marker, whatever. And I am pulling this sheet of paper. So when I pull, this means that I did increase or reduce the speed of this sheet. I did here when I pull it, I did increase or reduce the speed. 
What do you think? So the sheet of paper on here is not moving and you decided to pull it in this direction. Are you increasing the speed or reducing the speed of this paper? Do you understand my question? What do you think? You are starting from zero and you are moving, so you are increasing the speed, right? So where this marker is going to be moving? Is it going to be moving in the same direction as, as the sheet or in the opposing direction? What do you think? If I have a marker on the sheet and I'm pulling this sheet, would this marker move in the same or the opposite direction? So just put a piece of paper in front of you, put a marker, and just pull it. Increasing the speed, you will see that the marker is rolling in the same or opposite. What do you think? Let me ask you the question in a different way. You are in a car, and you are speeding up. Speeding up means what? Means that the car is moving, let's say from 30 miles per hour to 90 miles per hour. So where your body will go when you speed up, would your body move backwards or forwards? backwards so if i am moving at a faster speed i'm speeding up as there is an acceleration what's going to happen to the to the content inside my body is going to be moving in the opposite direction to the movement so the car is moving forward my body is going to be moving backwards what if this person here while he's speeding he hits a tree So what's gonna happen? I was moving at 90 miles per hour. Now I stopped. Now I became zero miles per hour. So where my body will be moving? Will it be moving backwards or forwards? Forwards. So now, if I am decelerating, I am reducing the speed, the, the car is, was still moving in the same direction. There is no change in the car direction. The car is still moving forward. But my body responds differently according to whether the car is accelerating, is speeding up, if I'm accelerating, what happens to my body? Is a body my body is moving backwards in the opposite direction. What happens in here? When I decelerate, when I reduce the speed, my body is gonna be moving in the same direction as the car. All right. So in both conditions, the car was moving forward. If I am accelerating, my body is moving in the opposite direction. If the car is decelerating, my body is now moving in the same direction. Does this make sense?
All right, so let's apply this on your semicircular canals. Again, inside the, at the base of the, each of the semicircular canals, we're gonna have a crest and elevation like this. And on top of it, you're gonna have the hair cells, like the ones that we've seen in the cochlea, like the ones that we've seen in the macula. And on top of the cilia of the hair cells, you're gonna have a gelatinous cap. We call this is my cupola. If you see on here, this is the cupola. We call the receptor inside the ampulla of the semicircular canals. This is my crystal ampullaris. The elevation in the ampulla, crystal ampullaris. So what happens to the crystal ampullaris? If I'm rotating here, in this direction. The fluid inside my semicircular canal, where will it go? If this is my, if those are my hair cells in here, inside my crystal ampullaris, those are my hair cells like this. And this is the cilia. Remember inside the tube, you've got inside the semicircular canals, inside the cochlear duct, inside the utricle and secure, you get endolymph, you get fluid. So if you are moving from zero to 10, your speed. So this means I am accelerating, I am moving faster. So what's gonna happen to the fluid inside? I will be drawing the fluid here in blue. Fluid, will it be moving in the same or the opposite direction? What do you think, one or two? If I am speeding up, speeding up, you're gonna be moving in the opposite direction. So you're gonna be bending the cilia of those hair cells in this direction. What if I am still rotating in this direction, but I'm moving slower? This all my same hair cells. This is still my cupola on here, the gelatinous cap of the crystal ampullaris. And here I'm moving from rather than zero to 10, I am moving from 10 to zero. I am decelerating. When I decelerate, the fluid inside the semicircular canal, will it be moving in the same direction or the opposite direction? One or two. If I'm decelerating, I'm slowing down. Remember, when you slow down, the body did move in the same direction. So again, again, when I slow down, while I, I'm rotating or I'm moving, it's gonna be moving in the same direction as the rotational movement. And if I am moving in the same direction, this is gonna be bending the cupola in the opposite direction, bending the cilia of the hair cells in the opposite direction. So my brain will be getting signals. If I am accelerating, different from when I decelerate. So your brain will tell you now, you are activating this semicircular canal. This means that you're moving up or down. But I don't know whether you are accelerating or decelerating. It's according to where did I bend the cupola. So where am I moving is going to be determined by which semicircular canal 
of the trees that you've got will be activating its crystal ampullaries. This is for the direction, which side? Am I going up, down, towards the right side, towards the left side? Am I going forward, backward? This is gonna be determined according to where the brain is getting the signals. Am I getting the signals from this semicircular canal, from this semicircular canal, or from this semicircular canal? Each one is, is, is gonna be covering one dimension that I can move with it. But how my brain will be able to figure out whether I am speeding up or slowing down, it's according to whether you did depolarize or hyperpolarize, according to whether did you bend the scupula in this direction or the opposite direction. And this will take place simultaneously in both ears and according to the signals sent from the semicircular canals in both ears, my brain will start to decode those signals and will be figuring out what direction and whether or not you, whether you are accelerating or decelerating. What do we call this sensation? My ability to know whether I'm accelerating or decelerating. This is what we called again. Any idea? Dynamic equilibrium. All right, so for the first in-class activity for today, Please complete this table on here. I please complete this table on here. So those two belong dynamic equilibrium. This is one thing. Those again are the organs in the inner or internal ear. Any questions? Any questions? All right, we can have a break for 10. We come back, discuss more about the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system.